Good afternoon, and thank you very much for joining us. I'm joined today by Dr. Nikki Kanani. There's no doubt at all that this country is continuing to make progress in the fight against COVID. We're proceeding with our roadmap, and I want to thank everybody for continuing to follow the guidance and to thank parents and families for the incredible work you're doing to help test pupils through the Easter holidays and to encourage you to keep testing them twice a week as schools return. And above all, I want to thank everybody involved in the outstanding vaccine rollout, especially those of you coming forwards in huge numbers as, as you are. 19 out of 20 of those who have had a first dose are coming forward for a second, meaning that almost one in five adults have now had a second dose. And on first jabs, we've now vaccinated 33 million people, including 60% of the 45 to 49 year olds. And we know that this vaccination program is making a big difference. We know that it's helping to reduce suffering and save lives, potentially on a, on a very big scale. But we don't yet know the full extent of the protection that we're building up, the exact strength of our defenses. And as we look at what's happening in other countries with cases now at record numbers uh, around the world, we cannot delude ourselves that COVID has gone away. I see nothing in the data now that makes me think we are going to have to deviate in any way from the roadmap, cautious but irreversible, uh, that we have set out. But the majority of scientific opinion in this country is still firmly of the view that there will be another wave of COVID at some stage this year. And so we must, as far as possible, learn to live with this disease as we live with other diseases. We'll be bolstering our defenses with booster jabs this autumn, this autumn, and we'll be continuing with testing. And today I want to announce what we hope will be a further line of medical defense. The United Kingdom was the first country in the world to pioneer dexamethasone, which has saved a million lives globally. And today we're creating a new antivirals task force to search for the most promising new medicines and support their development through clinical trials with the aim of making them safely and rapidly available as early as the autumn. This means, for example, that if you test positive, there might be a tablet you could take at home to stop the virus in its tracks and significantly reduce the chance of infection turning into more severe disease. Or if you're living with someone who has tested positive, there might be a pill you could take uh, for a few days to stop your disease yourself. And by focusing on these antivirals, these new antivirals, we hope to lengthen the UK's lead in, in medicines and in life sciences, and to give ever greater confidence to the people of this country that we continue on our path towards freedom. We've taken a big step again this month, reopening significant parts of our country. And for many people, this last week has brought the first glimmerings of a return to normality, having a pint, having a haircut, making that trip to the shops. Every day, science is helping us to get back towards normality. And I believe that antiviral treatments can play an important part. And if we keep going, follow the rules, remember hands, face, uh, space, fresh air, then we can keep each other safe and see through our roadmap to reclaim our lives in full. Thank you very much. I'm now going to hand over to Nikki. Thank you. Um it's Dr. Nikki Kanani. I'm a GP and medical director for primary care in the NHS in England. And since the last time I came to one of these briefings, I've been working with colleagues across the NHS to roll out the biggest vaccination programme in the NHS's history. I've been vaccinating at local vaccination services uh, alongside many of you, offering people second doses, vaccinating people in care homes, but also making sure that my patients can get the care that they need from the NHS when they need it. 
it was on the 8th of February when I was last on a podium a little bit like this uh, that uh, I was able to say that we were on track to meet our targets. And since then, the programme continues to go from strength to strength with the NHS meeting our first two deadlines on, vaccination, on vaccinating the most at-risk people. The public response has been incredible and I thank you if you've come forward for your first dose and please continue to come forward when you're asked to, to have your second dose as well. Yesterday, the UK celebrated hitting the latest milestone of 10 million people being fully protected from the virus. So to put that into perspective, that's the equivalent of the entire population of Manchester, Leeds, Liverpool, Newcastle, Birmingham and Bristol combined having complete protection against COVID-19. So we're making great strides, but this hasn't happened by accident. The success is down to the hard work of our staff, incredible planning and delivery. So I want to iterate my thanks to all of those uh, staff and volunteers, everyone involved in delivering our vaccination programme. And I want you also to make sure that you look after our staff at this really challenging time. I heard today that um, a group of people were protesting outside a mobile vaccination bus in Nottingham. I want to say now that we will not stand for it. It is of vital importance that you allow our colleagues to do the job that they need to do, that you allow them to save lives by vaccinating people. And as Prime Minister says, you allow our teams to get us back to the lives that we love and that we miss so much. I also said at this press conference two months ago that it wasn't too late to change your mind if you haven't yet come forward. That was true then and it's true now. Our offer is evergreen. If you've decided that you would like your vaccination and you're eligible, we have a vaccination for you. If you've had your first dose and you have your second dose booked in, please also be sure to get it. I had my second dose at the end of March and I can assure anyone watching or listening that it's safe. So please go ahead and take up that opportunity. One area that has uh, rightly been a concern has been uptake among people from ethnic minority backgrounds. And that feels really personal to me, both as a GP and as a woman of colour in this country. And that's why two months ago, on behalf of the NHS, I set out our action plan to boost uptake across people from ethnic minority backgrounds. And I'm pleased to say we've made really significant progress. Since we set out our plan in February, uptake from all ethnic minority backgrounds has tripled, outpacing the national average across all ethnicities. Take up among people from a Pakistani background has more, is more than four times higher than it was in February, and a five-fold increase in people taking up the vaccine from a Bangladeshi background. The progress is a direct result of a combination of NHS teams who know and understand their communities, community and faith leaders who've worked really closely with us, practical considerations about Ramadan and other local nuances, and really strong vocal backing from high profile uh, people such as uh, Bakos Nadia Hussain, comedian Lenny Henry and TV star Adol Ray. So I want to thank everyone involved in this effort. You've saved lives. But we're not done. Our job is not done. We will keep offering first doses as supply allows and in line with JCV advice on those who are most at risk. And I echo the PM's reminder that we all need to keep following the national guidance to reduce transmission, hospital admissions and deaths. And we too in the NHS will keep our side of the bargain, looking after you whether you have COVID or non-COVID concerns. We want to make sure that nobody is left behind. So I want to urge everyone eligible to join the millions already vaccinated to protect yourselves and others. So if you're invited to get a vaccine, please come forward. If you're asked or have the symptoms to have a test, please come forward. And if you have, if you have other health concerns, please come forward. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nikki. Let's go to uh, questions from uh, the public first. Annette from Leicester. Oh, sorry, Nick, you're going to do the slides first. The slides? Sorry, Lovely. let's no, sorry. go to the slides first. That's okay. Me. Um, so uh, we'll just take you through a couple of slides before we go to questions. Um, this is a slide that shows the number of people in hospital with COVID-19 in the UK. And you can see since our first peak on the 12th of April, so just over a year later, uh, this is on Sunday, the 18th of April, 1,973 people were in hospital with COVID-19. And if you move to the next slide, please. 
which I haven't had the joy of saying yet, uh, the number of people who have received a vaccination for COVID-19 in the UK. And you can see what PM and I have just described, where 33 million individuals, actually just over that now, have received a first dose. And of these, over 10 million people have also received a second dose. Thank you. Uh, we are yet uh, able to give you uh, those data or indeed what that statistic would say if we were able uh, to give it to you, Annette. That's not because we want to uh, to, to, to conceal anything from uh, people. We, I, we simply don't know, know that data. I, mean, I suspect the number is, is, is very small, but uh, if, in, if indeed there are any. But um, uh, Nikki, if you'd like to, yeah, to comment I, on that. Absolutely. Thank you, Prime Minister. It's a really good question, Annette. Um, I think what's really key is that every week we publish data that looks at both uh, COVID statistics, vaccination statistics and obviously any safety alerts as well. Um, so although they aren't triangulated every week, those statistics are produced and we're able to look at those and understand what that means and how that influences the vaccine programme. Thanks very much, uh, Annette. And uh, I mean, clearly people are going to, uh, uh, unfortunately, people will continue to, uh, to die of uh, other causes, irrespective of whether or not they've had uh, a vaccination. But I think your, your point is a, is a good one. Uh, let's go to Marilyn from London. And um, uh, Marilyn's question is, once international travel resumes on May the 17th, how frequently will the red list travel countries be reviewed? And what are the requirements for a country on the red list uh, to be moved to the amber or green travel lists? Thanks, Marilyn. Well, the, the, the answer is that we keep the uh, red list under uh, constant review. All countries uh, we keep under under constant review, judge the state of the pandemic in those countries. And this work is done actually not by uh, the government itself. It's done by uh, the, the Joint Biosecurity Centre. It's done by the, the JBC. Uh, they look at uh, the, uh, the, the issue and uh, they will make they will make the, their determination based on uh, what they think uh, we need to do, and clearly, if they think there's a you know a variant of concern, for instance, if they think that the uh, disease is taking off rapidly uh, in that country, or they, they have any other reason uh, for concern, then it will move uh, onto the red list and uh, and downwards uh, uh, if uh, it's going in a, in a different direction. So it's the it's the JBC that does it, and we keep it under constant review. Questions from the media, please. Vicky Young of the BBC. Uh, Prime Minister, a follow-up to that last question from Marilyn, uh, really, about the red list. In the past few weeks, tens of thousands of people have travelled between India and the United Kingdom. Uh, why did it take so long to put India on the red list? There are some who wonder why it took you so long to cancel uh, your planned trip there. Uh, and a second question, if I could, about climate change. The government, you've announced some uh, very ambitious targets today uh, about cutting emissions. Uh, but there are some who will point to things such as a coal mine in Cumbria, uh, the scrapping of the Green Homes deal, and wonder whether you really do uh, have uh, the confidence to take the decisions, the really difficult and maybe unpopular decisions that will be needed to meet those targets. Oh, thanks very much, Vicky. Uh, the uh, decision on India, again, was taken by the, uh, by the JBC, really in response in, in, to the, the state of the pandemic there and you, you'll recall that at the moment uh, this is a a very the what we're seeing in India is a result of a variant under investigation. It hasn't yet been deemed a, a variant of concern. I think that was why there was uh, there's been uh, the uh, delay. And um, I, what people I think what the the JBC has decided is on, on a purely uh, precautionary basis. Uh, it's necessary now to uh, put India on the red list. But I want to stress that uh, even before that, measures we have measures in place uh, for everybody coming uh, from India that are very, very tough indeed. So uh, people coming from India have to uh, quarantine, have to self-isolate. Uh, they then, uh, they have, in addition to filling in the passenger locator forms and all the things that you, you know about, they then have to take a test on day two uh, and on day eight. And it's because of those tests that we've actually been able to uh, isolate the cases of the uh, the so-called Indian variant, uh, the B1.617, uh, I think it is, uh, that uh, are, are, are currently under investigation. I think there are slightly over 100 
such cases that we've identified here in the in the UK and uh, clearly were uh, following up all of them following up their contacts doing uh, the surge testing uh, that you would uh, expect uh, I want to stress that it is still a variant under investigation not yet a variant of, of concern uh, we will look very carefully at whether it uh, shows any sign of being able to escape uh, the uh, the vaccines or escape the effect of the of the vaccines, uh, but but that's where we are at the moment. And and uh, by putting it on the red list, of course, by putting India on the red list, uh, what happens now is that anybody coming from India has to go immediately into uh, an even more stringent uh, regime of of hotel uh, of hotel quarantine. And on on your question about um, climate change and uh, how we can make these uh, very considerable. Uh, advances that we want to, uh, to make. I, I would just, just remind you that since 1990, the UK has actually cut uh, emissions uh, or cut emissions on 1990 levels uh, by something like 44%, 42%, 44%. And yet the economy has grown uh, by 73%. Or, uh, so I don't see any contradiction, uh, Vicky, between growth and jobs and building back better and tackling climate change. We can do uh, both together. In fact, I think we must do both together. I want the UK to be a global leader uh, in clean, green technology and in high-wage, high-skill, green jobs. That's, the, that's what we're aiming to do. We think we can do both uh, together. And the evidence of the technological progress that we've made in the last uh, 20 years, I think, shows uh, that we can. Can we go to Emily Morgan of ITB? Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, you've set a target to roll out possibly two antiviral treatments as early as autumn. Do you have two treatments specifically in mind that you know will be available? And if not, isn't that a hugely ambitious target? Uh, and if I may, on the football, do you really think that you can prevent a European Super League from happening if the clubs are determined to push ahead? Emily, on the uh, antivirals, uh, we've been discussing... Uh, the, the, obviously, we have the, there are various shots we already have in our locker, like uh, uh, dexamethasone. I think remdesivir is also uh, is also used in some cases. Um, and then there, you know, there are various other treatments with uh, names that, that you know that sounding a bit like Aztec uh, divinities. Uh, was tocilizumab, tocilizumab, uh, and 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 various others uh, that uh, were certainly uh, you know looking at uh, but i think probably on, on this one i'm going to i'm going to pass the ball to uh, to to nikki uh, and i'll come back and and say something about football but nikki why don't you say something yeah, about thanks emily uh, um so j just to recap we really welcome the introduction of the antiviral task force and um, to make sure we really focus on prevention and treatment in the community so managing a rise in infections or new variants um the nhs has been uh, working internationally actually to identify effective treatments for covid um and a huge thanks to the uh, over one million people in the uk who've participated in a research trial so far. Um, we know that over 22,000 lives have already been saved in the UK from the use of dexamethasone. So your question about sort of what have we got in the pipeline, there are a number of treatments at the moment that are being tested and refined. And what we found is that it's taken about six days to go from a positive research finding to put, you know, to put that particular treatment into practice. Um, so we're try, try, starting to look at budesonide and other treatments as well. Um, and this really gives us a chance to focus and ramp up pace um, on uh, the use of antivirals, uh, particularly in the community and at home. Thanks, Nikki. And, and Emily, on the football, uh, what I would say is that the, our first uh, step is clearly to, to back the football authorities in, in, the, in this country, the, the FA Football Association, the, the Premier League, and uh, the steps that they're taking to uh, counteract this initiative. But be in no doubt that we don't uh, support it and uh, support the creation of this European Super League. I think it's uh, not in the interests of, uh, of fans. It's not in the interests of, of football. How can it be right to have a situation in which you create a kind of uh, cartel that stops uh, clubs competing against each other, playing against each other properly, uh, with all the, the hope and excitement that gives to, uh, to fans up and down the country, I think it defends against the basic basic principles of uh, of, of competition, and uh, if necessary, uh, in order to protect that principle of competition, we will uh, seek, as as I said uh, to uh, to the, the bod those bodies earlier on, we will seek a legislative 
solution, uh, but we hope that uh, they can find a way forward uh, themselves. Can we go to Andy Bell of, uh, of Channel 5? Thank you. Um, you've spoken of uh, learning to live as much as possible with the virus, uh, Prime Minister. Michael Gove is in Israel today. We assume to be looking at their version of a COVID passport. Can we assume that uh, in the months ahead, one part of learning to live with the virus as much as possible is that there will be some sort of domestic COVID passport, some sort of COVID authentication. And uh, in terms of the football, please, um, can we assume that, do you regard this as a special case for government intervening in this sort of area? And what would you say to the, the billionaire owners of these clubs who presumably, if they spoke out, would say, look, this is our business and government should uh, keep out of it? Uh, first of all, thanks, Andy. First of all, on the uh, on uh, COVID status certification, uh, as we call it, um, uh, don't forget that under the current uh, system, under the, the step two rules, you don't need any kind of uh, certificate, and you, you won't need any, anything on. Certainly, won't need anything on the May the seventeenth uh, openings, uh, assuming that, as I say, we can uh, we can get that, which I'm very hopeful that we will. You won't need anything then. What we are looking at, I think, any responsible government would look at, is what ways we can uh, use people's uh, evidence of people's COVID status just to uh, just to open up some of those things that are really uh, tough and did prove very tough to open last year. And I wouldn't want to focus exclusively, Andy. On, uh, on vaccines, there's also your immunity uh, status and and testing is also uh, very useful. But, but we'll be uh, you'll be hearing more about that uh, in uh, in due course. Uh, you know, it, it is as and when we we find it, uh, if we indeed we find it useful. Uh, I think it I think it may very well be be useful. But we'll be setting it out in in due course, and people certainly don't need uh, to think about it uh, before uh, before May the seventeenth. And on your point about uh, 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 football. What, what would I say to the to the billionaire club owners? Um, well, I just I say I just say this that, that these clubs association, association football uh, football was invented and codified in this country. It is part is one of the great glories of uh, this country's cultural heritage. These clubs, these names, originate from famous towns and cities uh, in our country, and I don't think it right that they should be somehow dislocated. Uh, from their hometowns, home cities, uh, taken and turned into international brands and commodity, commodities that just circulate the planet, uh, propelled by uh, the billions of, of banks, without any reference uh, to fans and those who, uh, who've loved them all their lives. And I, and, I, and, I, and, we, we, and I don't think it right, as I said in my earlier answer to, uh, to Emily, that we should uh, forget the basic principle of, of competition uh, which is so important and gives so much excitement and, and joy to the sport. So that's what I would say to them. Um, let's go to uh, Harry Cole of the Sun. Harry. Uh, thank you, Prime Minister. Um, what are the odds of our readers being able to enjoy a European holiday this summer? And is it still too soon to book? And when can they book? And on the football, um, at the uh, leadership uh, meeting you had today uh, with, with community leaders and football leaders, you promised a legislative bomb uh, if, they, if they proceeded with this plan. Can you give us some insight into what that bomb might include? And is it true you're considering a windfall tax on clubs, visa restrictions, uh, taking away policing of matches? Um, what's, what is off the table? Is anything off the table? Uh, thanks very much, Harry. On, on your very good question about uh, about travel, we'd love to. I'd love to be able to give uh, you and and your your readers a, a a a clear rundown of the countries that we think may be uh, either red, amber, or green at this stage. We won't be able to do that yet, as we've said. The, the global travel uh, task force has reported, but what what they've said is that we're really going to need to wait till uh, early May before we can set out which is uh, which countries are on are on the list. And you can see the some of the troubles and uh, some of the problems in uh, uh, that some of our friends are are currently. Uh, having so, I think it'd be you know just premature uh, to to, to speculate uh, speculate about that. I'm I'm sorry about that, but we will be saying more uh, as soon as we possibly uh, can. But in the uh, before May the seventeenth, and uh, on the the legislative uh, approach that we could take, um, 
I, I don't want to say very much more about that, except to say that uh, that remains uh, something, certainly something we will uh, bring uh, to the forefront if we if we have to. As you know, Tracy Crouch uh, is doing a fan-based review of the whole uh, uh, governance of, of football, uh, how, it, how it works, trying to improve things for uh, for fans and trying to address some of the underlying issues that uh, we're facing. But I, I think what we want to do, first of all, is uh, back the FA, uh, back the, uh, the Premier League, and I hope that we can uh, thwart this proposal before it goes uh, very much further. I don't think, as I say, I don't think it's in the interests of, 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 of football or of, the, or of the fans. Let's go to Jessica Elgott of The Guardian. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, I wonder if you might give us an update on the, uh, the Janssen vaccine in the UK, um, uh, especially given the news out of the US and the EMA today uh, that they have concerns about it. Would that be a big blow to our vaccine programme, especially vaccinating the younger cohort of people um, if we if we encounter any difficulties? I know that we're waiting for its approval. Uh, and, and secondly, on, on football, I'd like to, to know really what is your own personal view of the German model of, of majority fan ownership of football clubs? Is that something you're instinctively in favour of or, or, or against? And is that something this country could seriously consider having here? Uh, okay, uh, thanks. On Jansen, I think I'm going to ask Nikki to say something as, as well. Uh, we're confident, though, in the security of our supply uh, and that we'll be able to get done what we've uh, said we're going to uh, to do by by the by by the end of July, Jessica. So that's that's the the key thing I get out to uh, get over about uh, about the vaccine supply. But uh, yes, absolutely. Nikki. So it's not a vaccine that we're using at the moment in this country, as you know. And as with any vaccine, we'd wait for MHRA approval, um, and we all take guidance from H MHRA and JCVI to plan our vaccine deployment into sites um, accurately and safely. Uh, right now, the priority is to get your vaccine if you're offered it, because we have the supply to vaccine vaccinate you if you're eligible. And sorry, it's on fan, uh, fan ownership and the the, uh, the German approach to, to this, Jessica. I think that's really a matter for Tracy, uh, Tracy Crouch and her review. I, I really wouldn't want to, uh, to, to preempt uh, what she's going to say, but I know she, she's uh, very interested in, in those sorts of uh, models and, and, and what that may or may not involve. Paul War of Huffington Post. Prime Minister, you've set out a new legally binding target to cut emissions by 70% by 2035, but also to include aviation in emissions for the first time. Does this mean that the third runway at Heathrow is now much less likely? Or if it does go ahead, will there need to be cuts at regional airports? And if I may, on green cylinder lobbying, it's sparked a lot of interest in whether the Nolan principles of public life have any teeth or relevance anymore. Do you agree with the Independent Office for Police Conduct, which in its review of your links with Jennifer R. Curie concluded, and I quote, it would have been wise for Mr. Johnson to have declared this as a conflict of interest and a failure to do so could have constituted a breach of the Nolan principles. Now, those principles include acting with honesty and integrity. Do you believe you acted with honesty and integrity in your relationship with Ms. R. Curie, who claims you conducted your affair in your marital home? Uh, well, thank you very much, Paul. And on your on your first point about uh the uh about it plans to to build another runway at heathrow that's a a matter for the uh for the company concerned it's a it's a private uh matter it's the if they've got to uh, to get it through to fund it uh and to finance it uh, themselves and um, in my own views about uh, that particular matter are, are well known um uh, but that doesn't mean that I'm opposed to aviation. It doesn't mean that I don't believe that this country has a great future uh, in pioneering low carbon uh, aviation. Uh, the two, the two, uh, aviation and a green future are not mutually exclusive, and they can be. Uh, they can be done, and that's why one of the uh, the, the the things that we set out in the, that I set out in the ten point uh, plan for the green industrial revolution uh, was to get to a a jet zero world, and the government is working with uh, partners across uh, uh, industry uh, to try to achieve that. There are all sorts of promising uh, looking uh, approaches, uh, all sorts of ways in which we could reduce uh, carbon emissions from uh, from planes. We've got to do it. it. In the end, humanity is going to need uh, to, to, to fly, and it's going to have to fly in a, uh, a clean, green way. And uh, I'm, I'm a technological optimist, as I said in my earlier answer, I think, to 
to Vicky Young of the of the BBC, I, and I think we can do it. And uh, my answer to your second question is yes. Okay, everybody, thank you very much.